I'm Carmine Gallo with famed historian and philosopher Yuval Noah Harari. He is the acclaimed author of such books like Sapiens, one of the best-selling nonfiction books in the world. And he has two books for young readers, Unstoppable Us, Volumes 1 and 2. We'll get to those in just a minute. Today, you're in for a treat because we are going to reveal a superpower that allowed sapiens to rule the world. A superpower available to all of us, but it's critical that we use it for the benefit of humanity. Yuval, it's a pleasure to meet you. It's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Give my best to your illustrator, Ricard Ruiz. I will. Because it's the illustrations and the graphics that really make this book come alive. I love it. As you can see, I, I know that this is billed for young readers, Yuval. But can you see this through your screen? Yeah, the I stickers can. stickers I have. Since <laughs> I pretty much marked every single page, I guess I can recommend the entire book for readers of my age as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> big compliment. First, big picture. Let's start yeah. with a big picture, Yuval, and then we'll drill down. About two million years ago, there were different kinds of humans. Neanderthals mm. roamed the earth. They had bigger brains. There were animals that were bigger, stronger, more muscular than we are, capable of surviving on their own. But something happened 70,000 years ago. What changed? Well, what we see is that a single species of human beings, our species, Homo sapiens, spreads from our ancestral home in Africa, uh, eliminates all the other human species that were around at the time, like Neanderthals, colonizes the entire world, including Australia and America, which are places that no human had reached before, and becomes the most powerful animal the planet has ever seen. What was the rhetorical tool that allowed that to happen? Well, what makes us really special is not something on the individual level. Individually, we are not, of course, physically stronger than other animals, chimpanzees, lions, whatever. We are also not more intelligent necessarily than other animals or other human species on the individual level. Our real secret of success is that we are the only mammal that is able to cooperate in large numbers, in very large numbers. You know, today we cooperate in, in hundreds of millions, even billions, you know, trade networks, religions, nations that have millions and millions of people in them. Neanderthals could cooperate in, you know, a few dozen Neanderthals, like 50 Neanderthals could cooperate in hunting together or defending their band against another band or inventing something new. Uh, Homo sapiens, our species, already around 70,000 years ago, discovered how to go beyond the level of the small band and create big tribes of hundreds, sometimes even thousands of individuals cooperating, uh, we see the emergence of the first trade networks. So you don't have to rely only on what you can find in your own territory. You can trade with other bands. We see ideas and cultural traditions spreading over vast territories. It could be cave paintings. It could be new ways to heal diseases. Like somebody discovers a new medicinal herb, they can tell it, they can tell about it to thousands of other people that benefit from it. This was our big advantage over the Neanderthals, over the chimpanzees, over the lions, our ability to cooperate in very large numbers. And this, of course, raises the question, how come we can do it and the chimps or the Neanderthals can't? And the answer, quite surprisingly, is our imagination. As far as we know, we are the only animal that can invent and believe completely fictional stories. You know, the, the, the best story ever told, the most powerful story ever told, was not told by the people who win the Nobel Prize in literature. It's the stories told by those who win the Nobel Prize in economics. Economics is based on fiction. Money is the most successful story ever told. Now, money has no objective value, 
whether it's gold coins or whether it's a paper banknote or whether it's bitcoins and electronic money, it has no objective value whatsoever. You cannot eat dollars. You cannot drink gold. You cannot make clothes out of Bitcoin. People tell stories about these things. You know, the bankers, the finance ministers, we believe these stories. And therefore, we can go to, you know, a supermarket, give a worthless piece of green paper to a stranger that we never met before. And she or he will give us, I don't know, a banana. That we can actually eat yeah, now this is talk, talking you can talk undo. about this in unstoppable us you talk about yeah. the uh the greatest storytellers or the bankers and the and the financial people have turned a story about money because like you say everything is based on a story that we have to tell that we have to believe in order to get people to obey the rules and that's how kingdoms flourish this whole idea of tracing the uh the power of our species to the stories we've told and the stories we tell. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that is not only fundamental to who we are, but it's something that we have to consider very seriously. Because as you've talked about in, in volume two of Unstoppable Us, there are good stories and mm -hmm. there are bad stories. What's the litmus test? I think you ask young readers a very good question. What's the litmus test between a good story, empowering story, and one that's not so good? Um. Basically, it's, it's suffering. Does the story cause people to suffer or does it help us to alleviate suffering? And, you know, the same story can do both if taken to extreme. You know, if you think about, I don't know, football or baseball or some other sport, on the one hand, it's a wonderful story that, again, brings together sometimes tens of thousands of strangers. But if you take it to extreme and you forget that, you know, the, the rules of football, we just invented them. And this is just a game we created. If you forget that, then you can start having uh, 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 football hooligans beating each other because they argue about the rules or about some inf what, whatever. And it goes all the way to the level of religion and of nations that, again, mm -hmm. on the one hand, uh, without religious and national mythologies, it would be very hard to get millions of people to cooperate and help each other. And, you know, I pay my taxes partly because I believe in the national mythology. So I give part of my money to so that strangers that I've never met before in my life and I will never meet in my life that live maybe hundreds of kilometers away on the, another side of the country, I give some of my money uh, so that they will have health care or education because I believe in the story that we are part of the same tribe. Of, of the same community. And this yes, is good. The, the link. On, on, the, on the other hand, if you take into extreme mm -hmm. and going in, you know, ultra national directions of starting to hate everybody else that doesn't belong to our nation, to our tribe, this can easily lead to wars and, and, and discrimination. And we should be, oh, again, very careful to see when uh, the story that we created to help ourselves starts to take over and we uh, 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 do terrible things just because of, of, of fantasies in our mind. You know, most wars in history were not fought over territory or food. They were fought over imaginary stories. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a fascinating link. Can I read a quote from Unstoppable Us, Volume 2, that I think is just beautiful? And I think it summarizes everything we're talking about. Eagles fly because they have wings. Humans fly because they know how to cooperate in large numbers. This is what makes us so powerful. All the big achievements of humankind, such as flying to the moon, were the result of cooperation between hundreds of thousands of people. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned flying to the moon and Neil Armstrong because I had this unique opportunity to have dinner with Mr. Armstrong and oh. some friends. And we were... Uh, Oh, at an Italian restaurant, enjoying wonderful Italian food and wine, and he regaled us with stories of landing on the moon. But it reminded me, your quote reminded me of something. He was very adamant about making sure that those 400,000 other people mm. got the credit for getting Absolutely. him to the moon. And it, it taught me something, Yuval, that great leaders share credit because mm. they know it's about cooperation. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, everybody remembers Neil Armstrong, but it's obvious when you think about it, he couldn't have reached the moon all by himself. Uh, to build the spaceships, you need not just, you know, the engineers, you need even the people who grow potatoes. So the engineers have something to eat while they are building the spaceship. If they have to go and, and look for their own food, they won't have time to build a spaceship. Well, this brings us to the storytellers, the dreamers, those people who can stir our imagination. As you write in your books, the storytellers play an important role in everything from the building of countries to the building of corporations. When it comes to the moon landing, I've always been fascinated with John F. Kennedy because mm -hmm. he was a poet president. He loved poetry and understood the power of metaphor, the power of words and speeches to inspire people to reach the moon. So again, this brings up the topic. I'm sure you would agree that stories that inspire people to higher levels of yeah. human achievement are the good stories. But as leaders moving forward, especially young people, they have to understand the distinction between an empowering story and one that actually causes harm. I, th I think that's the critical distinction we have to focus yeah, on. Yeah, absolutely. And also always to, to have um, a certain amount of humbleness mm. that maybe the story we tell, which we think is very inspiring and good, yeah. maybe it has, again, a dark side. Maybe it has problems that we cannot see. And therefore, it's very important to always acknowledge that this is just a story created by humans, so uh, 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 others can change our story. I think this is, you know, going back even further in time in American history, this was the genius of the founding fathers who wrote the Constitution, uh, that they included, you know, the Constitution of the U.S. is also basically a story. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, rules invented by humans. Instead and of kings. The, what a concept. And, yeah, and, and the genius of, of, of those who wrote it, that they acknowledge, they didn't say this came from God. God is not mentioned anywhere in the Constitution. It starts with we the people. We created this story, and because we might have made some mistakes, it also includes a mechanism to amend itself. We need to be humble about the stories we create and always remember to include an amendment clause in case the people who come after us, the next generations, they are wiser than us on certain things, and they should have the opportunity to amend the stories we tell. Well, there's no question that stories uh, can inspire and inspire people to become even better storytellers so that they can use stories for good. I I'm thinking of one example in particular that you write about in Unstoppable Us, which is Nobel Peace Prize winner Malala, Malala mm. Yousafzai, as an example of a dreamer who was a storyteller and whose stories changed the lives of millions of young girls. I spent some time with Malala's father in oh. Abu Dhabi during a conference, and I'll tell you something I found fascinating. You, you may or may not know this. Malala herself came from a family of tribal storytellers. Oh. People would come from all over to listen to her grandfather and her father tell stories of their culture. She was so inspired by stories of heroic women that she entered public speaking competitions. So that's mm -hmm. what that tells me, Yuval, is that good stories, powerful and empowering stories can inspire the next generation of storytellers too with the caveats that you mentioned. But it yeah, seems I, to me, unless, I, tell me if I'm wrong. I've often said that storytelling is in our DNA. I understand that biologically that's incorrect. I get it. But no, it, 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 is it ingrained in our ancient brain? As far as we can tell, yes. Uh, it's yeah. common to cultures everywhere. We don't know of a single human culture in history that did not love stories. And uh, in every culture, Stories are not just entertainment, they are the foundation of society. The, whether it's the mythological uh, 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 creation stories, whether it's the legal framework of society, it always comes in the shape of stories and not, for instance, in the shape of equations. You know, in, in science, we often uh, uh, try to describe the world with numbers and, and statistics and equations. 
And these are very powerful tools, but most people find it somewhat alien because we don't think in terms of statistics and, and equations. If you want to get, you know, where did you talk about climate change or genetics or whatever? If you really want, if you do this, the scientific study, then yes, you have to deal with numbers. But if you then want to reach the public, you must find a way to translate the numbers and the equations into terms of stories, because we are a storytelling animal, not an equation solving animal. We are on the same wavelength because in my notes, I said, ask you all about this portion of his book where he talks about <laughs> the fact that for millions of years, humans have never had to deal with numbers. And then in the side of my notes, I put climate change. Oh. When when leaders are trying to solve big problems, it's not enough just to show big numbers because that's not no. what people's minds gravitate to. You have to tell the story behind the numbers. So exactly. learning history, learning how our species evolved will make us better leaders today. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, we can't really understand anything about the world of today if we don't look at the long term history of humanity, whether it's religion or economics or politics. Uh, of course, we are the product of thousands of years, even you know, hundreds of thousands of years of history. Um, my take on history is that history is not the study of the past. It is the study of change. Like it's understanding the mechanism of how things change. And of course, our examples come from the past. But the lessons should be applicable to the present and the future. Since our uh, ancient brain influences so much of what we do and our decisions and, and everything, uh, our evolution influences it, I have been dying to ask you a question ever since I started reading Sapiens. Why are we, as humans, fearful of public speaking? <laughs> to one extent or another, everyone, almost everyone has some sort of anxiety or a full-fledged panic attack. That has to go back to something tribal, does it not? Yeah, because we understand the stakes. Oh. That, uh, again, because we are a, a storytelling animal and our power ultimately comes not from physical strength. It comes from the ability to persuade other people to think like us. So this is maybe the, the most important ability and uh, the most consequential uh, uh, interaction with other people is when you try to convince a large number of people, including strangers, that your story is true or your story is better. This, again, this is our superpower. Um, and... Whether we, we think about it consciously or not, deep inside, we understand the stakes. That the moment we get up in front of a crowd and try to convince them of something, this is maybe the most, some of the most crucial moments in our lives. And uh, unfortunately, this makes us feel very anxious. And actually, it's a good thing because it makes us feel very careful about what we say. One of the problems we see today, for instance, with social media and with online communication is that this anxiety is gone. And you might think, oh, this is a good thing. Now I can say anything I want without being anxious and worried. And this is in part behind the epidemic of outrage and uh, 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 fake news. And because people can say anything they want. They have no anxiety that they can lie, they can say terrible things, and they hide behind the screen. And this is not a good thing. Uh, we should, because of the importance of the stories that we tell publicly, we should be held accountable to uh, these public stories. If you're in a private meeting with a few friends, then at least my position is you can say anything you want. You are entitled to say stupid things. You're entitled to say even terrible things. In, in, this, is why, this is what our, our friends for. But if you speak in public, this is a different matter. And uh, again, for thousands of years, if you spoke in public, 
this was a, a terrifying moment. So people were very careful what they say. Now is the new technology. You can say, again, terrible things or stupid things without any accountability, and this is not good for us. That's fascinating. Yuval, at the end of your book, one more question for you. You yes. end volume two of Unstoppable Us with a cliffhanger. Speaking mm. of storytelling, it's a cliffhanger. You talk about how stories have held tribes together, how it, stories allowed us to build kingdoms and our species to rule the world. But then you say, how did some stories spread all over the planet? Not just in separate kingdoms, but how did stories spread all over the planet? And I was waiting for the answer. And the last words of your book are, well, that's a whole other story, which tells me there's got to be a volume three. Volume but three, you can't yeah. leave me on that. Don't <laughs> leave me on that cliffhanger. Give me a tease. Hmm. How, <laughs> tease me. Three, how, did, how did stories spread all over the world? So volume three would be about the kind of formation of the first big empires and universal religions like Christianity and Islam and Hinduism. And again, this takes the story to a new level. It's not like how one society became convinced of a particular story, mm -hmm. but what makes it possible for one story to spread really all over the world? Uh, but it's, there is no simple answer to that. We, we'll just have to wait for volume three. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. This is the type of history book that everyone should be reading, young readers and adults as well. Excellent job. Yuval, thank you for your contribution to, uh, to history and the understanding of our species. It is a pleasure to meet you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It was a pleasure for me, too.